fun, they can share it. Uh, the name of this lesson today is Kingdom of Heaven and, and the Kingdom of God. And that chart is an excellent uh, example of, of how this all works. I don't know who made it. I can guess. But uh, it's, it'll help set everything straight because this is kind of confusing when you, when you start studying this stuff. But before we get started, I need prayer. And I need you to pray for me because I got a cold and, and this I'm going to be going fast because I got so much information. Our dear precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the time that we can come together and open up your word. Lord, I pray for the gift of teaching this morning, Lord, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak through me, Lord, and that you'll get me out of the way. Let no words proceed out of my mouth except those that come from above and from your word. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for all that you've done for us. We pray that you'll give everyone open ears and open eyes, and Lord, help us to apply it to our lives and be more effective in our witnessing to others. For I ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. The kingdom of heaven, and you've heard this pastor teach on this lots of times, and I, would, I had a whole lesson made up, but I hear people asking the pastor questions, and, they, and, it, and it just, God says, teach on it. Because I had to teach it this week anyway uh, to people on the internet. But anyway, the kingdom of heaven is a physical, visible, literal, and material kingdom. It it's, uh, it's always has a king reigning over it. And uh, it, it comes and it goes. The kingdom of God is a righteous, it's a peace, joy in the Holy Ghost, invisible and spiritual kingdom that you have to be born into. In, Re in, in Revelation chapter 11, 15, and we'll be coming back to this verse later, it says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there was a voice in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world are come unto the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. So this is the end of the book. This is, end of, this is the end of Revelation. That means that this happens in the end times when Jesus Christ will rule and reign over this world. Right now, it's not happening. Of course, he has the last say. He only, uh, Satan can only do what he wants to do. But... If you want to blame somebody for your cancer, for your illness, blame the devil. I mean, he, everybody wants to blame Jesus. And everybody wants to blame God. But no one ever blames the devil. And he's the, one because, he's the reason for all this. So the kingdom of the two kingdoms right now aren't together. There's only one kingdom going on right now, and that's the kingdom of God. And that will uh, be taken out here shortly. So who, where did all this, who has control of the world right now? Satan. And it's been like that since the beginning. And I know a lot of people don't believe in the gap theory, and that's fine. But when the earth was created, it was the heavens and the earth, and we, we looked at this, the heaven and the earth were created. Singular, first chapter of Genesis chapter 1. And it, you wonder who was in charge of this thing and why did it go into chaos and void? Because God never creates anything in chaos and He never creates it in in in, uh, other than perfect. Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 14 says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the 
holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And of course, we know that when we get to Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, the earth is in, Jesus Christ comes down to this earth, walks on the, on the deep, and, re, and starts the, the process of atoning the earth and bringing it back to where it was. But there's a God of this world, and he's still here, and he's still fighting for control. We find in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. So the Bible's given this guy uh, credentials that he is the God of this world right now, with a little g, not a big g. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, he says he's the prince and power of the air. In Luke chapter 22, verse 53, it says he's the power of darkness. In Colossians Chapter 113, he says he's the power of darkness. And then when you go to Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, the devil takes Jesus up into a high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, if you'll get down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. So he had a, he had a right to give those kingdoms away. But of course, Jesus Christ rebuked him, and he's going to get it the right way. So... When you look at this, you look at your chart, you'll see the, the black earth, and that's where the earth went into chaos. And then when you go to the next one, it's Adam. And God decided he was going to create a man after his likeness. He was going to give man a free will. He was going to give man the ability to love and and and. Uh, be loved. He gave Adam the ability to sing, and a lot of people say, well, don't angels sing? No. It says the sons of God sang. Those were the pre-Adamatic people in um, Job chapter 37. But man was made to have a relationship with God, and that was real important for God, to have uh, a relationship with man, to be able to walk with him in the heat of the day and, and commune with him and, and man to worship God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So Adam had dominion when he was created. He was created after God's likeness, with God's image. And you see that on your chart. But Adam sinned. When tested, just like the devil, when he was tested, Lucifer sinned against God, rebelled against God. And God cannot tolerate sin. And with Adam, it says... In verse uh, 17 of Genesis chapter 3, it says, And Adam said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. How many of us had, ha, has done that? <laughs> and it's always been a mistake. God put the man over the, the, uh, the uh, family. He's the head of the family. God's the head of the, uh, head of the church. And we're to look to God for guidance, and, and we guide our wives. He says, because you've done this, he says, I'll, I'll, I'll curse the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And that's true. Life is not an easy thing. It's a hard thing. I mean, if you, if you, when you get my age, it's all trouble. <laughs> it seems like. But in Adam was tested and failed, and, he, and God drove him from the garden. And now Adam is cursed to, to work the fields and to work by the sweat of his face. The kingdom of God 
was taken away at that time because God, Adam lost his image of God. So that was taken out. So the kingdom of God is gone. Now, the next thing, he has the kingdom of heaven. And when this is all going on and Satan uh, caused Adam to fall and Satan starts taking advantage of it. So he starts to rec uh, he starts his own hydra race of people. I was talking to the guy in Germany. In the United States, you cannot talk about giants and everybody thinks you're crazy. But he st this German was telling me, they teach that in high school about the giants. The Greeks say that that's their history. We are so dumbed down in America, we don't know what to believe anymore. But where I lived up in Ohio, that was full of mounds. And the mounds were said to be uh, burial places of giants. Men as tall as 36 feet, 12 feet, 15 feet, 9 feet, 8 feet. But that was common history up there. And you go on the internet and type in Mount Giants and you'll have newspaper articles all the way back to the 1600s. But we're not allowed to talk about that. When Satan thought he had altered God's creation, God found a man. His name was Noah. And God gave that crown to Noah. And Noah carried it all the way down to Abraham and it goes to Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Moses, David, Solomon, the 20 kings of Israel, the 18 kings of Judah, to Jeconiah was the last. And Jeconiah was despised by God because he disobeyed God. God told him to do something. He didn't do it. So God puts a, uh, takes away his, his uh, right to rule over the children of Israel, or Judah. He even takes the first two letters from his name. Remember what Moses, uh, when, when Abraham was, uh, got his unconditional covenant with God, God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. He put the breath in Abraham. He put the breath in Sarah. And with this man, he has J-E, that's Jehovah. And they took it off in, in Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 28. He takes it off because he despises this man for what he did to the, to the nation of Israel. Instead of obeying God. And he says, Is this man, Kaniah, a despised, broken idol? He is a vessel wherein is no pleasure. Wherefore are they cast out? He and his seed and are cast into the land which they know not. Of course you have uh, Zedekiah and he despises, or he, God despises him too and causes him to be killed or his family to be killed and his eyes plucked out after he sees the death of his sons. But no one is able to rule and reign over the tribes of, of Israel because of this man. And so we have a, a quandrum. There's no one allowed, no one's seed, no king can rule over Israel. So God puts him into Babylon for 70 years, and the, for the first time there is no kingdom of God, and kingdom of heaven on this earth. And that goes for all the way to John the Baptist. And when John the Baptist comes, what is he preaching? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and be baptized, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So you go all the way down to... Um, and he's preaching that the Son of God is coming. And he's going to bring the kingdom in. This kingdom is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. 
At the same time, that's why when you go to, to uh, Matthew, you'll find the kingdom of heaven and you'll find the kingdom of God preached. Then you'll go to Ma- Mark. He talks about the kingdom of God. And you go to Luke and he talks about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. But they reject it. When you, uh, when you look at the kingdom of God, in Matthew, it calls Jesus Christ the Son of Man. So that's telling you they're talking about the kingdom of heaven, a literal reign on this earth. And to be in this kingdom of heaven, you have to have repentance, you have to have water baptism, you have to have confession of sin, and you've got to do the Sermon on the Mount. You've got to live by the Sermon on the Mount to get into the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is totally opposite. It's not your righteousness. It's His righteousness. What He did for you on the cross. And you have to receive His atonement for your sins and Jesus Christ comes and lives within your heart and it's a salvation by faith through grace. God gives you all that in order for you to be saved. God's power and work is what saves you, not you, not anything you can do. You can't get into the kingdom of God by working. It's all by the grace of God. Through faith, it's all about what Jesus Christ and his precious blood that was shed on Calvary. And he imputes righteousness to you. You don't have your righteousness anymore. When God looks at you, he sees God's, Jesus Christ's righteousness. That you're whiter than snow. But we sinned, and of course we confess our sin, and he's faithful and just to forgive us for our sins. But you cannot lose your salvation because it's not yours in the, in the first place. It's his salvation. So, at the beginning, it's Jews only. An exclusive club that we can't, the Gentiles can't join. They can't participate in. In Matthew chapter 5, verse Uh, 10 verse 5 it says and these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them go not in the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Sumerians enter ye not but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and as ye go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand because it was at hand if the nation of Israel, as a nation, would have accepted Christ, the kingdom would have came in. And Jesus Christ would have been ruling and reigning as the the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven here on earth. But, the Jews did not receive it. Now the New Testament began when Jesus Christ was on the cross in John chapter 1 verse 29 it says and the next day Jesus seeth uh, next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith behold the lamb of god which taketh away the sins of the world John chapter 19 verse 30 says when Je- Jesus therefore had received the vinegar he said it is finished And when God says something is finished, it's done. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. That was the beginning of the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You cannot serve the living God unless you are born again. It's impossible because God does not know you until you receive His Son. When you receive His Son, the Bible says He gives you a new name. We sing about it all the time. And for this cause, He is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption 
of the transgressions that were under the New Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now notice the, 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 uh, the way this thing's worded, it's legal terms. For where the uh, testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, for the testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. But Jesus Christ did not stay dead. He rose again on the third day, Amen. and he lives. he's sitting on the right hand of the Father, ready to return for those who believe on him. So, Jesus Christ teaches, if you want it all, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things must be added unto you. He didn't say the kingdom of heaven because if you seek the kingdom of heaven, you're going to have to wait a while, but the kingdom of God is readily available right now. All you have to do is receive him as your personal savior, and you're born again. John chapter 3, verse 3 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't even see it unless you're born again. And of course, Romans chapter 14, verse 17, says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy and the Holy Ghost. It's a spiritual kingdom that you have to belong to. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can offer both kingdoms to the nation of Israel. And he chose Peter as a means of getting that message through. And of course, it's up to the individual because God created us with a free will. It's like in math, Romans chapter 9, it says, the creature asks God, why did you make me thus? Well, if he, God didn't make you the way you are with a free will you wouldn't have the ability to love the person next to you. You wouldn't have a, 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 the ability to have a relationship because it's all, you're walking around here like a, a robot programmed to do whatever he wants you to do, but you're not programmed. Of course, the world wants to program you, and they're doing a great job of it, by the way. Just try leaving home without your cell phone. You go in a panic mode. Oh, I can't go without my cell phone. But people go through this life without Jesus Christ and don't think a thing about it. In Acts chapter 1 verse 3, it says, it says uh, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, when Peter got his great commission, but wait for the promise of the Father, saith, uh, which saith, He, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall bap be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. You wonder why John, Peter, James, and John fumbled around during their, their uh, discipleship with the Lord Jesus Christ for his three years, and they fumbled around, they made mistakes. But it wasn't until they got the Holy Spirit that they had power and they went boldly into the world preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. But after Stephen, when Stephen gave a sermon to Israel, to the, San, uh, the, the religious leaders of Israel, they rejected him and they stoned him. And while they were stoning him, they, Stephen looks up into heaven and sees Christ standing, ready to return, but they rejected him. So Jesus Christ sat back down on the right hand of the Father. Then they went to the Jews in Acts chapter 13, verse 45, and when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and 
uh, Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should have been pr- spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles, thank God. But all this was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9, that the Jews would reject him and that it would go to the Gentiles and they would receive it. And for, for, century, or for centuries, the, the church has been made up of Jew, or Gentiles and Jews both. God deals with the Jew individually and he deals with the Gentiles on an individual basis. You can either receive him or reject him. If you reject Jesus Christ, God will reject you. Because when you go to the judgment seat of Christ, it's not going to be based on how good I am. It's going to be how do you rate with Jesus Christ, and you cannot go there. No matter how much you try, you can't go there. Jesus Christ is the perfect Lamb of God. And I dare say there's not one person in this place is perfect or even near perfect. Amen. Because as long as you got this flesh that Adam gave us, you're going to have problems. I've got your Bible. Okay. In uh, Acts chapter 9, Paul takes the gospel to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are receiving... He still has a, 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 lot, a hard time with the Jews. Of course, the Jews always, as a nation, as, as a religious people, or the religious part of Israel, always hates the Lord Jesus Christ. You see these, I watch these videos over in Israel, and I see these, these uh, priests uh, acting like they're giving a, a sacrifice on these altars, and... They'll believe in anyone as a Messiah as long as it's not Jesus. Basically what they say. But they'll be surprised one day. They will receive him. The kingdom of heaven is postponed because of the Jews' rejection. And it goes strictly to to the kingdom of heaven, or kingdom of God. And Paul preaches the kingdom of God. And then we get down to the, to the last part. After the seven year, after the seven church ages, and we're in Laodicea right now. And if, you're, if, if you know any Bible at all, you can see it. You can see how, how we're so apostate in this country. And it's all over the world. I mean... I talked to that uh, German boy. I was really impressed with him. He loves the Lord. He wants to get sa- he he wanted to get as much learning. And he came over to the house and he talked for almost ten hours one day. Comes over the next day. We stays about three or four hours, and then he comes over his last day and spends about twelve hours, twelve thirteen hours, and we talked the entire time. We we searched the scriptures. And he wanted to make sure that he was doctrinal, doctrinally correct in the way he thought. And I was so impressed with that. And I was thankful that God could use me to, to help him out. And he wants prayer because he's trying to find a wife. And that's a difficult thing to do when there's no churches. The church he goes to is, is run by the South Koreans. And it's a good church. And... Uh, we set, we bought him a Bible, uh, King James Bible, uh, and the German, one side is German, one side is English, so that he can compare script, make sure the scriptures are right. And it's a real blessing. Now, when we get through the seven churches, and we're right there right now, anybody that can see that we're in apostasy, and most churches today think that they're rich in need of nothing, but they don't know that they're miserable, plime, uh, poor, blind, naked, 
And God says, he's knocking on a door. He wants to come in. If you open that door, he'll sup with you. And, and he says, every church age, he that overcometh. And if you overcome, you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's overcoming. And if you've done that, God is in your heart and you're on your way to heaven. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it doesn't matter how good you are or how good you feel about yourself, you're on your way to hell. When the church age is over and Jesus Christ returns, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 4, 1, that there will be a door open in heaven. And a voice will call you up like a trumpet. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every last one of us have to appear before that judgment. And that will be during that seven-year period while the tribulation is going, down, going on down here. We'll be up there and we'll give an account of our lives, of how we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says you're not, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. You're His. And you'll have to give an account. And it says here that, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So some of us will suffer loss. But like I tell everyone here, be looking for the Lord Jesus Christ because there's a crown involved. If I don't get any other crown, I want that one. Because I want something that I can put at His feet. Because for what He did for me, what we do for Him is very little. It's a, it's a little sacrifice. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 8, He says, And to and, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. When you get rid of this body, this flesh, and you get your new glorified body, you'll be able to have your own righteousness. And we'll be able to glorify God in a perfect body. We've got a perfect soul with a perfect spirit, which we already have but we'll be able to worship Him non-interrupted. But of course, when, when, when we're taken out of this world, for the next seven years, there will be no kingdom of God. There will be no kingdom of heaven. And the next kingdom on your list is the, the kingdom of the Antichrist. He'll rule and reign on this earth. And he's going to try to destroy as many people as he possibly can because the more he kills, the more will not receive Christ or uh, get, get right during the tribulational period. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, it says, And the beast was taken, and him and the false prophets wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived the them had received the mark of the beast and to them that worship the image. God is going to punish anyone who takes that mark and they're working on that mark really hard. And it's just a matter of when they put it into effect that you'll have to go get a mark. You'll have to get a chip implanted or something. The technology is going so quickly and so fast that that, you know, they had a tattoo and then they had an implanted chip. Man, they, they've come so far that they could probably just go in and kapoomp, kapoomp, and you're done. And that will change everything about the way you think. And you will not be able to comprehend the love of God. You will not be able to uh, receive Christ as your personal Savior your whole being will be changed. And they know that they can do this. Look at your cell phones. Look at, look, go walk around, and you see people walking into 
to, to signs and you see people walking right out in the middle of the street without even looking to see if there's any cars coming. They got their, in, their indoctrinated to that device. They even brag about the fact that they've changed people into androids because people are connected to their phones. They're connected to their electronic devices. And now they consider you an android. And the next step will be to implant that, and, that device in your body and to, to fully connect you, to upgrade you, they call it. It's a downgrade because you'll no longer be able to become a child of God. We're living in some wild times, I'm telling you. We're ready for the Lord Jesus Christ to return and take his church out of here. Because when this stuff starts, we're already out of here. We're, we're gone. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, it says, And when they had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So when you get saved during the tribulational period, you will have to die. And you say, well, I don't believe that. Well, you'll starve to death, or you'll die of thirst, or you'll get your head cut off. But you're going to die if you, if you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you endure to the end. That is the way it is written. When you go to Matthew chapter 24, Jesus Christ is talking about the last days. He's not talking about, uh, he's talking about the tribulation period. He's not talking about where we are right now. We do not have to endure to the end because we have the Lord Jesus Christ in our heart. And the Bible says He seals it. It can't come out. I can't get rid of it. Just like Abraham, when he sinned, he still had an unconditional covenant with God. Abraham was asleep when he had this covenant. He had nothing to do with it. It was all God. Just like your covenant with God. It's not you. You received Him, but once you received Him, He seals it, and it can no longer leave. I'm amazed that people that come to this church still are questioning that. Verse 10 says in, in Revelation chapter 6, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And the white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest a little season until their fellow servants... Also, and their brethren should that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So God delays His coming back to this earth in order for more Jews and more Gentiles to receive Christ during that time and have the ability, uh, have the opportunity to die for Christ. That's enduring to the end. That's what it's talking about. Matthew chapter 24 was written to the Jews. It wasn't written to the church. In Jeremiah chapter 30, it calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. And that trouble, that word Jacob, or James in the Greek, means it's to the Jews, not to you. The time of Jacob's trouble. God is going to pour wrath, his wrath down on this world, and it's going to be horrible for everyone that's here. Even those who receive Christ as their Savior. But Jesus Christ is going to return. Our first verse that we read, Revelation chapter 12, 10, and I heard a voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of His grace. The world is given to Jesus Christ during that time and He is coming back. But in Matthew chapter 11 verse 12 it says, And from that day 
the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violence taketh it by force. Jesus Christ is going to come back and take his kingdom back by force. It's not going to be a pretty sight. It's going to be bloody. The Bible says it's up to a, uh, almost 160 miles up to the a horse's bridle. So it's going to be pretty deep. Don't be here and drowned in blood. That'd be a horrible death, wouldn't it? Revelation chapter 19, verse 4 says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Guess who that is? I like to see where I'm in there. And I'm not in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm back of him. I'm following him. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 19, And I saw the, saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and the, their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Now, people say, well, how are they going to fight against him? Well, there are generals out there that are bragging about the weaponry that we have today. And I heard one, I, I wish I'd have recorded it. He said that if Jesus Christ tried to return today, we could stop him. How blasphemous is that? How boldful bragging is that? The one who holds every molecule together. You know, that's the biggest mystery in the world is how does an atom stay together? It's opposing to, to each other, but it still exists. You, got, you know, when I was working, we had to go through these classes every so often, and we had to study the atom. And those atoms, they just can't figure out why they just doesn't fly apart. Unstable atoms do fly apart, and they bust, and they, they cause a, a real eruption. That's what atomic bombs are made of. But he holds all of that together. So they don't know anything about what they're talking about. And then Jesus Christ will come back with his kingdom. This is the honeymoon of the wedding. We, he's wedded in, the bride is now his wife, and they're coming back for their honeymoon on earth. And he sets up his kingdom, and he rules and reigns for a thousand years. The Antichrist and the false prophet are cast into hell, and then the devil is locked up into a pit. God puts him in chains, puts a seal on him, and if you study the, the laws of the seals in the Bible, no one can remove that seal except the one who put it on there or the one it was sent to, like a letter. Jesus Christ, when God sets a seal on Lucifer, he is not going anywhere. And, he's, and God allows him to, or keeps him in there for a thousand years. And at the end of that thousand years, Satan will be turned loose on this earth again. Right now, during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are both here. But in, in, the, in the tribulation, your salvation is going to be based on faith and works. When you get into the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, it's all works. There's no faith in Christ because Christ is here. So... During the millennial reign, there's going to be a lot of people with their unglorified bodies having a hard time with this because they're still sinners. And Satan, when he's turned loose, will gather a large army. And you'll find this in Revelation chapter 20, verse 8. It talks about the Gog and Magog. And it says, And shall go out and deceive the nations which are on the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. And the number is as the sands of the sea. The last part of verse 9, And the fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So the earth is destroyed by fire. You'll find that in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. It says, But of the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, 
in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Now you're getting to the last of the circles. You'll notice that the last one is, or next to the last one is, a, looks like the earth is on fire. It's burning up. And then when everything is, the, the heaven burns up, the earth burns up, and there's nothing here but a great white throne with Jesus Christ sitting on that throne, and everyone that's ever lived, their bodies and their soul will be resurrected just like our resurrection. And their body and their soul will be reunited in front of the great white throne. And for the first time, they're not burning. And they're looking down, I got my body. I got another chance. I can... I, I, I'm sure I can convince God not to send me back to that place. But when they see God for the first time, or Jesus Christ sitting on the throne, they'll beg Him to send them to, to the lake of fire, to get out of His sight, because He's a holy and righteous God. And the only one that can stand in front of Him are those who have been redeemed by the blood. And they'll stand on absolutely nothing That's that... We talked about the deep will be gone and they'll look down and all they're going to see is that lake of fire underneath them that's way down there. And they'll be called up and they'll look, on, look in the book and if their name is not found in the book of life, they'll be picked up by a big old angel and this big angel will toss them into the lake of fire. And they'll fall and fall and fall and they'll finally fall into this lake and they'll be burning and burning forever and ever. And the Bible says the smoke of their torment goes up forever. If you don't know him, you need to know him. You need to get right with the Lord. Let's, let's pray. I've run out of time. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you'll bless this message. I pray that Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, I pray today will be their day of salvation. I pray that today will be the accepted time for them, Lord, to be saved and to live for you forever. Lord, we're just looking for your coming, and I pray that it will be soon. Blessed be the holy name of Jesus Christ. Lord, it's all about you. It's not about us. Let this next part of the service be completely and entirely about praising and worshiping you, Lord. And let the Holy Spirit have dominion in all of our hearts and lives. For we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.